But after that, after they've crossed the threshold of 35, they may be considered employees. This could have a big impact on freelance writers, which is what I'm worried about. The upside would be to think, well, at that point, people who are working for somebody regularly become employees. Great. That means that, you know, they'll get all the benefits attendant. On the other hand, we know that most corporations are not going to want to turn anybody into an employee if they can avoid it. Because at that point, they have a lot more responsibility toward the worker. They've got to make withholdings from paychecks, and they've got to provide benefits and so forth. Does that mean people will use California writers less? Does that mean there'll be more outsourcing of work to other states or even other countries to avoid these kinds of laws? Because although California is the only one that has one now, a lot of other states are thinking about it. I'm always all for anything that protects writers, but I do think there is a valid reason to have a world of freelance writers. Most professional writers I know started with some kind of freelance gig or another, and nobody ever thought they would get rich or be able to support themselves doing that, but it's a good way to get experience, to start building a resume, to see your name in print. I submitted many freelance articles long before I ever published a novel. I had a regular gig writing a a column for a a, a nonfiction magazine that covered the comic book market, which I thought was great fun. And it gave me an opportunity to work with an editor and a publisher for the first time. Didn't get any money, but I didn't care. I had a day job. What I was trying to do was getting writing experience. And that was great for me, and I think it will be great for others, and I don't want to see those opportunities go away. This is, of course, the first iteration of this bill. Usually, legislators don't get everything right the first time, and they have to go back and make amendments. But I do want them to be careful not to write freelance writing out of existence. I've mentioned before that this is the time of year when a lot of important writing conferences take place. And this segment in the writing tips section of the podcast comes out of this year's Writer's Digest annual conference, and particularly a session by Kilby Blades, who is both an indie author and a professional marketer, talking about how to develop successful marketing campaigns. And of course, that means focusing on what constitutes success. On the last podcast in this section, I talked about the importance of envisioning your ideal life, then planning how you're going to get there. And I think this panel was really an extension of that idea. You need to get specific about what it is you want to accomplish. Uh, In this session, Blades really encouraged authors to to be straight with themselves, be honest about where you are and what it is you want. Is it the glory of seeing your name on the spine of a book? Uh, Do you want to tell your friends you're on the bestseller list? Do you want some replacement income so that you can uh, dump your day job or do less of it or whatever? It's important to focus on exactly what you want because how you go about it is going to be different. You know, what is it you want? There are As Kilby pointed out, lots of award-winning authors, or for that matter, New York Times best-selling authors, who cannot support themselves from the book sales. They've got a day job they teach, or they've got a spouse, or a trust fund, or whatever. But uh, the fact that people know who you are and can see your books in a bookstore doesn't mean you're living off your book income. So what is your goal? If your goal is to win awards, Well, you're not going to get the Pulitzer for writing popular fiction, probably. You need to read and then write some version of literary fiction. Similarly, if you get yourself on the New York, if you you want to be on the New York Times list, you probably need a traditional publisher. On the other hand, if you're looking for replacement income or to make a little bit more money, then you need to be focusing on how to do that. You're probably more likely to accomplish that by writing popular fiction, and you're probably more likely to make the kind of money you want if you are an independent author. Because then you can think about, what do I want? How do I get there? This is what I will do. I won't count on other people to do it. This is what I will do to get there. For instance, just to give you an example from the session, 
Kilby talked about, okay, let's say your goal is to make an extra $10,000 a year so that you can stop doing this or you can take a great vacation or whatever. How are you going to get there? Well, let's say you've written some kind of popular fiction novel. You're going to sell it as an ebook for $3.99. And so in order to generate the kind of money you want, that means you've got to have about 1,500 readers who will buy this book. Except wait a second. That calculation assumes that it did not cost you anything to get that book in front of those readers, but it probably did. At the very least, you've probably had some kind of marketing campaign, which almost certainly involves Amazon ads. If you want to sell well on Amazon, well, then you've got to take into account the cost of the advertising budget, which, and here they're making a lot of assumptions, but in order to make that 10000 at th- that point, you need Just under 3,000 new readers because you've got to factor in not only the money you want to make, but the money you're going to have to spend to advertise it. All of these are calculations that require you to focus on what it is you want. What drives you to sit down in front of the laptop and type and think and go to writers' conferences and small group retreats and listen to this podcast? What is your goal? And then once you figured out what you really want, is it awards? Is it bestseller lists? Is it sales? Once you know what you want, then you can figure out how to get it, which of course is what this Red Sneaker Writers Center and all of the programs we provide are about, helping writers achieve their dreams. But that means, first of all, you've got to understand what your dream actually is. My interview this time is with Dan Millman, author of The Way of the Peaceful Warrior and many other wonderful books. Dan was the keynote speaker at WriterCon a while back, and he thrilled everybody in attendance, not only with a tremendous keynote address, but also by doing a handstand from a standing position, no run-up, no drama, just did a handstand on a chair and sustained it for a good long while. You can see photos on the WriterCon website, and I don't think Dan would mind me mentioning that he was 72 years old at the time. Obviously, this former competitive gymnast has stayed in shape. He had a lot of wonderful things to say at the conference, and that's why I wanted to interview him. I know many of you listening to this podcast are working on a memoir, How did he start with a memoir written when he was still relatively young and turn that into a book that has changed so many people's lives? Here's what he had to say. Dan, thanks for being on the podcast. Hi, Dale. You have written, I think, 17 books all the way from The Way of the Peaceful Warrior to The Hidden School, the most recent one, right? Yes, So that encompasses what, about 40 years of writing? About that, yes. Comes to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to guess maybe you've learned a thing or two along the way, and yet it hasn't been so debilitating that you've stopped writing. (laughs) (laughs) Because you're you're working on something else now, right? Yes, I am. Every project is humbling in its own way, as you well know. Um, It's fresh. We start fresh each time, though we do carry some experience, um, hopefully shedding some quirks, writing ticks along the way, and learning how to communicate more clearly and effectively in the process. You know, I did mention to you once that I was working on my final, probably my final book. I don't know for sure, Mm -hmm. but it feels like it um, after all these years and decades. uh, And it is a memoir. Now, Mm -hmm. I, if I had a mission, if I had a literary mission, um, uh, I would, I would encourage every person I ever see or meet to write memoir, whether Mm -hmm. or not they intended to get it published. 
that's a separate issue. But it's so valuable, the innate process of writing about our life and, and reliving it with the wisdom of our years and looking back and selecting and creating like a, a bonsai tree. You know, it, it's created by trimming and pruning into a shape and creating a shape, not just an autobiography where you're just trying to download everything you remember, though the process could begin that way uh, from the time you were young or been told about your even younger years than you would remember. Um, to the present day, it's it's an incredible exercise, and it would it's guaranteed to appreciate in value over time as a gift to one's family, children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren. Uh, when it, when you've passed, and they and they say, well, what was his life or her life? What was it about? What was it like? In their time, I wish I knew more about my grandparents and their lives, for example. I would be thrilled if I discovered a, a diary or a mm-hmm. journal. So I think memoir is, oh, exactly. is, memoir is valuable in itself just as a process to do. Um, mm-hmm. And I encourage people, it, it can be a good start to one's writing career. You know, they say, write what you know, but it's been said also, write what you don't know and learn about it. Um, but if you do write mm-hmm. what you know, it's a fantastic process to begin your writing career with a memoir. Now, I did not do that, even though some people think I did. My first and best known book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, is about my college years um, with uh, an old gas station attendant who was quite enigmatic and wise, whom I called Socrates. Um, and that it reads like memoir during my college years and after. And yet I've been quite straightforward about it. That's a semi-fictional autobiography. It, much of it is based on my real life, but I also wove fictional elements into it. So I would never call it memoir because proper memoir, as you and your listeners know, does not is not supposed to contain any fiction. So the book I'm working on now will be the story behind the story and uh, it, it will have no uh, creative fiction in it. I'll, to the best of my recollection, I will have it as accurate as possible. So it will be my first memoir, actually. You were really ahead of your time, well, in a lot of ways. But, you know, creative nonfiction has become kind of a buzzword in the publishing world in the past decade or so. But you were, in effect, doing that a long time before. Well, yeah, that's an interesting observation, Bill. I, um, in a way, I was. I mean, to me, creative nonfiction is writing nonfiction, whether it's a self-help guidebook or an inspiring work uh, on a topic, using narrative, the narrative style, where it reads uh, in a compelling way with some kind of, of uh, perhaps chronology or flashbacks uh, or a, an examples, at least, anecdotes. Um, but I wrote autobiography. Uh, with fiction uh, woven in for the sake of the story and, and, and also the teaching elements in that story. Uh, some of the visionary journeys I wrote in Peaceful Warrior um, were created to give the reader a kind of visual, hopefully kinesthetic experience rather than just talk, blah, 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 and say, you know, you can realize this fact or that fact or have this breakthrough. Um, so yeah, so, yeah I, I think um, it is a new field. Now, you know, I, I didn't draw upon, but I also had read uh, the first couple books by Carlos Castaneda, uh, his Don right. Juan series, The Yaki Way of Knowledge, and so on. And and he did that. Now, he claimed it was all true, and, and I know for a fact that it, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> he, he met, you know, a shaman uh, or two and did his research for his PhD in anthropology, and he created a book. Um, but it was highly fictionalized. But I, I haven't tried to deceive anyone. I was pretty straightforward uh, from the beginnings that mm-hmm. it, it was a blend. Uh, and I ran into trouble. The bookstores didn't know what shelf to put it on. Is it fiction or nonfiction? Right. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why it went out of print when it first came out. And then when it came out in paperback, it started getting around and has been doing so ever since. Um, so I know a lot of people listening to this are also thinking about writing a memoir. And at this point, having heard you say this, they're probably thinking, OK, where do I draw the line if I start enhancing my autobiography, when does it stop being an autobiography and become a novel? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and certainly, uh, unless you're one of those rare people, most of us don't have infallible memories. 
Uh, certainly, we don't remember, uh, except for rare instances, every word we said or someone else right. said to us. So there is some inevitable uh, reconstruction or what might I have said? What would I have said? And mm-hmm. to do it as accurately as possible. And, and in fact, even even what we even if it's all factual and recorded from journals, uh, we'll selectively take what parts we want to take and leave out others. 